Well, welcome to St. Peter's Online. We're so glad that you're with us today. My name is Xavier, and whether you know Jesus or not, or whether you're just here investigating things or interested, warm welcome to you. In a moment, you will hear the Bible read and then explain. We firmly believe here at St. Peter's that God speaks to us today through His life-giving Word. And my prayer is this will help you to know Him or to know Him better. Enjoy following along. Our Old Testament reading this morning comes from the book of Haggai, starting at the first verse of the first chapter. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Jerobabel, son of Sheatil, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Josedach, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai, Is it a time for yourselves to be living in your panelled houses while this house remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says, Give careful thoughts to your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but you are not warm. You earn wages, only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thoughts to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honoured, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty? Because my house which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew, and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the olive oil and everything else the ground produces, on people and livestock and all the labours of your hands. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, Joshua, son of Jezedek, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai, because the Lord their God had sent him and the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Sheatil, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Josedach, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. They came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty their God on the 24th day of the sixth month. This is the word of the Lord. The New Testament reading is from 1 Peter, chapter 2, beginning at verse 4. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. 
Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you, as foreigners and exiles, to abstain from sinful desires, which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. This too is the word of the Lord. I've missed this wonky pulpit. <laughs> uh, look, thank you for your warm welcome uh, back amongst you at St Peter's today. And thank you too for your prayers and support over the past couple of years as I've kind of found my feet in the role of bishop. Uh, it has on the whole been an encouraging start, but not without its challenges. Uh, you will know, I'm sure, that Western secularism and biblical Christianity these days have diametrically opposed views on lots of fronts, but particularly with regard to sexual ethics and gender identity. Biblical ethics are now not merely seen as laughable or outdated or repressed, but as shameful, harmful and repressive. Our views are not merely seen as wrong, but as dangerous. We no longer hold the conservative, uh, the, the cultural reins. Indeed, our conservative Christian views are no longer respected. Biblical values are increasingly viewed by our governments as an impediment to its vision of a flourishing future. Uh, now, many of you will also know that over the past 18 months, I've come head to head with opposition in these kinds of matters. Uh, I've been hammered in both social and mainstream media. The diocese over the last 18 months has also faced legal action and all for seeking to have a pastoral conversation with someone engaged in willful sin according to the scriptures. Uh, thankfully, that situation was resolved at a conciliation meeting uh, before the anti-discrimination New South Wales without us being com uh, compelled at all to compromise on our principles. Now, in my view, the resolution of that matter was a miraculous answer to prayer. It truly was. Um, so thank you to all of you who were praying, and I know lots of you were, really felt uh, uplifted and, and strengthened by your prayers. Now, all of this has been a wake-up call to me about where we now stand with our culture as evangelicals who seek to uphold the plain teaching of the Scriptures. The cultural tide is running swiftly against us. As Christians, we will be tempted to withdraw, to paddle into a backwater to avoid the cultural heat, tempted to keep our heads down and wait for the angry cultural floodwaters to pass. But I want to suggest to you today that this isn't the first time that God's people have faced such a temptation. Welcome to the world of Haggai. Look with me at chapter 1, verse 1. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Josedach, the high priest. Uh, so this was in the year 520 BC. Haggai delivered five brief prophecies over nine months to the post-exilic Jewish community. Zerubbabel was the governor of Judah. Joshua was the high priest serving God's people. This was a community under pressure. Having returned to Jerusalem from exile in Babylon through permissions given by the Persian conqueror King Cyrus, they discovered that the world had changed. Initially, they were full of enthusiasm to return and re-establish their identity, to rebuild Jerusalem at the new temple on the rubble of the old temple. But soon, the harsh realities of the post-exilic situation began to set in. While they knew their God, given identity, was to be the Lord's treasured possession, a kingdom of priests, a holy nation under God's rule, 
Their new situation made that hard to believe. They had no kingdom, no anointed king, just a governor appointed by Persia. They saw no evidence that would suggest that they were God's treasured possession. Indeed, their neighbours were hostile and striving to hinder their rebuilding efforts. As for being a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, work on the temple of the Lord had ceased. Currently, there was nowhere for God to dwell or a place to offer sacrifices for sin. So the book of Ezra gives us the historical background to the prophecies of Haggai. If you want to see the background, read the book of Ezra. Eighteen years had now passed since their permission to return to Jerusalem, and the covenant promises seemed a distant memory. And in those 18 years, economic woes had set in, and opposition had risen. The straw that broke the camel's back for Israel was an unfavourable report from nearby opponents, which was written to the new king of Persia, accusing the Jews of stirring up a rebellion by rebuilding the temple. And so in Ezra 4, verse 21 and 22, we hear that the Persian king sent back this answer. Now issue an order to these men to stop work so that this city will not be rebuilt until I so order. Be careful not to neglect this matter. Why let this threat grow to the detriment of the royal interests? So you see, now the Jews were the bad guys. Their interests were on a collision course with those of their Persian rulers. And the result was that God's people stopped building the temple. They lost their zeal. They settled down to a quieter life. They kept their heads down and they adopted a less God-focused identity. So as not to upset the Persian Empire's cultural and social building program. In Haggai 1 verse 2, the prophet sums up the way God's people were now thinking. This is what he says. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. See, God saw what was happening. His chosen people had convinced themselves that their inaction was somehow strategic. Yes, there'll be a time for rebuilding the Lord's house, but it's not now. We'll just keep our heads down and stay out of the firing line for now. And so they justified their inaction on the tasks that had been given to them by God, and that was not good. But that wasn't the only problem, because at the same time, they got busy with something else. Look with me at verse 3. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai, Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your panelled houses? while this house reigns, remains a ruin? You see, sadly, God's building agenda had been displaced by their own. The reference to their houses being panelled implies luxury. So when it came to their own homes, they were in upgrade renovation mode, while God's house remained a ruin. Was God okay with them losing sight of the main game like this? No, he was not. And this is why he'd brought judgment on them. Look with me at verses 5 and 6. Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but you harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. Did you hear that? Give careful thought to your ways. It's time for God's people to stop and have a good hard think about where they're at and what has happened as a result. And verses 9 to 11 flesh out God's judgment on them for their failure to rebuild God's, to rebuild God's house. Look with me. Verse 9, you expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty? Because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the olive oil, and everything else the ground produces, on people and livestock and all the labour of your hands. You see, God has brought covenant curses on his people. 
He's sent drought. He's withheld economic prosperity to wake them up and bring them back to him. And so comes the call to repentance. Look with me at verse 7. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honoured, says the Lord. It's time for them to change their ways and to reorder their priorities to honour God. But this is a call to put the Lord's agenda ahead of their own. Instead of keeping their heads down and feathering their nests, they're to stand up for him and be who he has called them to be and do what he has called them to do. Yes, they'll encounter opposition from their culture for getting on with the building of God's house. And yes, it will mean self-sacrifice materially, but it is right that they do because God's honour is at stake. You know, the call to honour God in the face of cultural hostility is still our call today. Uh, Steve McAlpine, in his excellent book called Being the Bad Guys, How to Live for Jesus in a World that Says that You Shouldn't, uh, draws strong parallels between Haggai's world and our own today. This is how he puts it. The, ooh, he doesn't put it like that. See, what have I done? Going back. Not sure what's happened there, Julie. It's, it's a, a slide that says the personal building projects. You got that? Okay, just listen. <laughs> uh, Steve McAlpine says, the personal building projects in which Persian kings stare down the temple building efforts while encouraging us to focus on our panelled houses must be resisted. McAlpine then goes on to outline a blueprint for us to get on with God's agenda as Christians in the 21st century, and I'll come back to that shortly. Can I say, if you haven't read that book, can I encourage you to do so? Uh, I'm actually on my fourth time through this book, partly due to the season I've been in, but I commend it to you all as a very good read. Uh, I've got 18 copies with me today. They're at the really reduced price of $16 if you buy it with a, with a card or $15 for cash. Those who'd like to have one, see me after the service. But for now, let's look further at the book of Haggai. Uh, God's people have been called on to repent. How did they respond? Look on with me at uh, 1 verse 12. Here we go. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the whole remnant of God's people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai because the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the Lord. Now, I've got to say, this response is every preacher's dream, okay? Not just the leadership team, but the whole remnant of God's people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and heard, that they'd heard through the prophet Haggai. Why? Because they knew that Haggai's words were God's words. They believed that the Lord their God had sent him. You know, this verse is a reminder of why we should respond in obedience to faithful biblical preaching. Uh, in 2 Timothy, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, the Apostle Paul says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. That verse tells us that God's word is inspired by God, literally breathed out by him. Yes, human mouthpiece, but God's words. And so when Haggai the prophet spoke, the people heard God himself speak and therefore they obeyed. The people feared the Lord, this verse says, and therefore they stopped ignoring his word and started living his way for his glory. Well, as I said, this was a great response, and with it came tremendous comfort. Look at verse 13. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message to, of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. I'm with you. Friends, with genuine repentance comes the comfort of reassurance. 
knowing God's forgiveness is a wonderful thing, and knowing that God is with you as you make a fresh start is a tremendous reassurance. And so it was for God's people back in Haggai's day. And with the reassurance came a renewed resolve. Look at verse 14. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. They came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month. Well, that is a great outcome. Just three weeks after God's challenge through Haggai, they're back on the tools. They're getting on with the job of building God's temple. Now, from the book of Ezra, we know that the rebuilding work did proceed. Indeed, about four years later, it was completed. But it was not without opposition nor without sacrifice. Again, they had political opponents who wrote to Darius the king, though this time without success. And over the first year, Haggai continued to encourage them to persevere with words from God. And so we move to chapter 2, and in 2 verse 9, he goes on to encourage them. He speaks of the promised glory of the new temple. Though in the building phase it was hard to see it ever matching the temple's former glory, the people are urged to be strong, to know that God is with them. The people are encouraged not to fear because the Lord, the Spirit, remains among them. And in chapter 2, Haggai reminds them that God is all-powerful and he will achieve what he's promised. Have a look at verses 6 to 9. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while I will once make more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations and what is desired by all nations will come and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. Do you notice in these, these verses, four times we hear the phrase, the Lord Almighty, the Lord Almighty, the Lord Almighty, the Lord Almighty. Get the impression that God's powerful. And God has the power and he has the resources to fulfil his covenant promises, but they must trust him and persevere with the task at hand. Well, the encouragement continues in verses 10 to 19. Though they are a defiled people, God will bless them. And finally, in verses 20 to 23 of chapter 2, comes a promise of the establishment of God's chosen king. In those final verses of Haggai, we hear that the Lord will overthrow thrones and shatter the powers of foreign kingdoms. And on that day, the Lord will re-establish, or establish rather, Zerubbabel of Judah and make him like his signet ring, that is, his chosen king. Now, history tells us that the Zerubbabel uh, did not, in fact, go on to become the king of the nation. He remained simply the governor of the province. But Haggai's final message is one of hope for the future of King David's line. Haggai is declaring that God is doing a new thing in their day and Zerubbabel is a symbol of the future Davidic line. And that is why when you come to the New Testament in both Matthew and Luke's Gospels, they include Zerubbabel in the genealogies of Jesus. You see, the Lord would ultimately rule eternally through a king descended from David. And, of course, from where we stand in salvation history, we know that God's word through Haggai was fulfilled just over 500 years later with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. What was promised to them is now fulfilled through Jesus. He is the king in David's line who was to come. So where does that leave us today in thinking about the prophecy of Haggai and its relevance to us? Well, let me suggest to you that the future glory is still the promise for God's people. For Zerubbabel and God's people back then, hope was found in looking forward to a temple filled with the glory of his descendant. And King Jesus would stride into that very temple building hundreds of years later. 
for us as God's people today, our hope is in that day when the resurrected and reigning Lord Jesus returns. He's still the king. But what of God's agenda? In Haggai's day, it was the rebuilding of the temple. In our day, the building project God has given us is to build Christ's church. In 1 Corinthians 3, uh, Paul says this, Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person, for God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. You see, under the new covenant, God's gathered people is now where God dwells by his spirit. We are his temple. Again, in 1 Peter 2, verses 4 and 5, we read this. As you come to him, that is Jesus, the living stone rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also are like living stones being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So you see, Christ's church is now the temple of God and it is headed for a glory we cannot even imagine. At this time, amidst opposition from our culture, that description may not feel true or or feel plausible, but because of God's future resurrection promise, it is true. And our task, as we look forward to the day of Christ's return, is to keep building Christ's church. Well, how might we do that? How might we get on with the building project that God has entrusted to us? Well, Steve McAlpine, that's a picture of him. He spoke at our recent clergy conference, by the way, over at Copeton Dam. It's a brilliant time with him. Um, But he suggests a threefold strategy in his book Uh, that I think is worth reflecting on as we finish. This is the strategy to build Christ church, the the project that we're on. And he he starts by suggesting we need to preference God's people. Let me read you just a little bit of what he says. If we look back in 30 years' time and ask what basic strategy has been most successful in staying the hand of secular culture, I am convinced that the sheer simplicity of Committing to meet with God's people will win hands down. The church is the New Testament temple of God and we neglect this building program at our peril. Now, preferencing God's people sounds like a simple strategy, but it requires considerable resolve. It is far easier to focus on our own panelled houses and self-improvement projects. The world around us is saying, you do you. And that way of thinking doesn't involve self-sacrifice for the sake of others. But McAlpine suggests that a surefire apologetic for the church is its ability to create deep community across social and cultural boundaries. As Western cultures fracture into toxic tribalism, it's crucial for churches to form uh, deep, Thick communities based around more than convenient more than convenience. We need to do life together. Church services, meals, times of ad hoc gathering in which conversations are sprinkled with grace. This is what will challenge our culture and build Christ's church. I think we need to do some thinking about what thick Christian communities look like. I'm encouraged by this church. Lots of people are in in small group uh, Bible studies, growth groups, where you can do life together, look at God's word hard, encourage each other, support one another when things are tough. That is good. I heard a story recently of someone who's just moving to the town. Fifteen St Peter's people turned up to help them move in. That's the kind of thick community we want, where people genuinely love one another as Christ has loved us. Well, the second part of the threefold strategy to get on with building Christ's church, uh, McAlpine suggests, is to proclaim God's praises. Again, in 1 Peter 2, after speaking of us as living stones being built into a spiritual house, the apostle reminds us of who we are and why we've been chosen and made God special people. Look with me at 1 Peter 2 verse 9 from our second reading. Peter says, but you are a chosen people a royal priesthood, a holy nation, 
God's special possession. Why? That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Friends, notice from this verse that we've been rescued for a reason. What is that? That we may declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. The church must proclaim God's praises. McAlpine says on this second point, whatever the near future holds, churches that have neglected the deepest need of Christian community, namely to get to know Jesus better and allow him to reshape our identity as the people of God, will eventually cave in to a hostile culture and follow the path of least resistance. When Jesus and his goodness are proclaimed in our buildings, proclaiming God's praises, it will seep out into the rest of our lives. His name will be spoken around our dinner tables and even in our workplaces. He will be shown to be our hope, our very public hope, even as secular hostility rises. That's a great challenge, isn't it? Well, the final part of the threefold strategy is to get on with building Christ's church by promoting God's promises. Okay, preferencing God's people, proclaiming his praises, promoting God's promises. We're talking about evangelism now. Uh, making and growing disciples of Christ is the phrase you're using here at St Peter's. Steve McAlpine says with regard to promoting God's promises that there is currently an openness to the gospel message in our society despite the hostility. Historic levels of anxiety, fear and loneliness abound. The church is a community of promised resurrection hope in a society that is terrified of death and anxious about missing out on the good stuff that advertising offers. We have something which many in our world want but cannot find. Friends, as we move into the Christmas season, we need to remember that we have been entrusted with the life-transforming good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Sharing the hope we have in Jesus with the world around us is crucial if we are to build Christ's church while we look forward to his return. Remember uh, in Matthew 28, Jesus' final instructions to his followers? They were gathered in Galilee at the mountain where he told them to go. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You see, the task at hand is to get on with the job of making disciples who will trust in Jesus for forgiveness and then go on to live lives of obedience to him as Lord. Friends, this is the building program entrusted to us. Our diocesan mission statement sums it up well, I think. If you've forgotten it, let me remind you. We're on about introducing all people to Jesus and helping them home to heaven. Now, as I say, I know you're already on that page here at St Peter's. Uh, my wife Jenny spoke yesterday at a women's uh, gingerbread event put on by one of the uh, 10 o'clock uh, service uh, congregation members. Many, I think about 20 women, came to hear the good news of Jesus heading into Christmas season. I see you've got your St Peter's Christmas Carnival and Carols event coming up soon. That is fantastic. And no doubt there'll be other opportunities to invite people to Christmas events in the next few weeks as well. But can I encourage you to do that? Do invite people. Do come yourself. Bring them with you. Keep your gospel boots on here at St Peter's. Um, Keeping your gospel boots on is a phrase I've been using all over the diocese in the past few months and it's bounced out of a passage in Ephesians 6 which is all about the gospel armour as we take our stand against the devil and his evil schemes. And in that passage, Paul encourages us to have our feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Okay, feet fitted with the readiness that comes with the gospel of peace. Do you know, 
So often when churches experience discouragement, whether it be through opposition from the world or conflict from within with relationships or even the challenge of a pandemic, so often they pull off their gospel boots and go into survival mode. Big mistake. Paul reminds us in Ephesians 6 that often the best way to defend is to attack. So we must keep our gospel boots on because it's only through hearing the good news of Jesus that people will come into God's eternal kingdom and Christ's church will be built. Well, I hope you can see some of the parallels between the world of Haggai and the world we live in today. In view of what we've heard today, let's not be pressured by our culture into keeping our heads down as Christians to avoid the flag. Let's not fall into the temptation of losing sight of God's agenda by building the wrong house. Let's not become fearful and lose sight of who we are in Christ and where our future lies with him eternally. Rather, in the light of God's word, let's get some steel in the spine and persevere with building Christ's church in his strength alone and for his glory alone. Amen. Well, I hope that was helpful for you. Uh, here at St Peter's, we consider ourselves to be God's dearly loved children. We're passionate for him and we desire for everyone to know Jesus and to grow in him. And we have so many activities around that for toddlers, children, youth, uh, young adults, adults and more. Feel free to drop in any time at one of our gatherings at 8 a.m. is kind of more traditional service, 10 a.m. or 4 p.m. We have children's programs or 6 p.m. In the evening, that's followed by dinner. You'd be more than welcome. If you'd like to know more about Jesus, we'd love to help you. We do a series called Hope, and you can meet new people. Or if you'd like to join St. Peter's, uh, we have a special series called Belong, which can help you find your feet. So let us know. You can text us on 0466 200 791. I'll repeat that for our radio listeners, 0466 200 791 or you can use the QR code which we'll leave up for the next minute or so. Enjoy your week.